Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Hack Your Career. I am Beverly Benson. I am a cybersecurity education manager here at Attack IQ. Very happy to uh, bring a wonderful guest uh, that will share his experiences. Uh, we're going to uh, have a great conversation with Kendrick Washington. He is an information security analyst at Vulcan Materials Company. I hope that you are able to stay for the entire show because I do have a special guest uh, at the end and her name is Corrine Ishio. She is our head of global talent acquisition. And at the end of our show, she's going to share some resume and networking tips. Okay, Kendrick. Yes, hello, how are you? Welcome. I am wonderful. Welcome to the Hack Your Career show. Uh, thank you for taking some time to spend with us and share a little bit about you and your cybersecurity career. All right, thanks for uh, having me. Oh, you are so very welcome. So first, briefly tell us about you and yourself. Well, uh, to kind of sum it up, uh, I've, uh, I've done just about everything in in the IT field at some point in time, you know, from networking to web design uh, to programming and, and help desk and stuff like that. So uh, it really, for me, the, the transition to cybersecurity was kind of a unique one because I didn't really go to school and, and have a formal program to do so. So I kind of had to work my way into it, but I've worked many, many years doing network troubleshooting uh, for Vulcan Materials, and then also some, at some point serving as head webmaster for several years while still doing network troubleshooting. <laughs> uh, I've spent many years on the help desk, which was really good. And I, honestly, I think all of these things together allowed me to be a well-rounded security professional because I can see it from the network perspective, the desktop perspective, et cetera. So that's, that's awesome. pretty much me. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. How important was, was internships in your early career? It was so good. I did four of them. You know, I, I took as many as I could. <laughs> so, um, and, and I, you know, if, if you were permitted, I like, I like to share my successes and failures and certain things. So I was very fortunate to uh, get an internship at Vulcan Materials uh, many years ago. Okay. Came out of school and wasn't one of those super like stellar students had like a 2.8 GPA, but, um, I had something that I found to be really, really critical to a person that wants to be successful in this field, and that's very determined. And so I came in for my internships with the determination to, you know, that I could do the job, you know, and so I had the, the work ethic and everything, you know, and even though I had like a 2.8 GPA, I pretty much was on deans and presidents list after I finished my party phase of school, <laughs> you know, so, so th that with that combination, I beat out a lot of students. And I've seen other students have the same uh, experience where you don't necessarily have the highest GPA, but for some reason that recruiter for the internship believed that I could. And this is her exact words. I was like, why did you choose me over all these other students who had a good GPA? And she said, I just felt like you could do the job. Nice. And that's how I got my first, that's how I got my first uh, internship. And then, you know, proceeded to do four more <laughs> or four total. Now, and think about all your your four internships. Did any of them kind of nudge you towards cybersecurity? Uh, honestly, not the time. So I, I, as you can see, I'm probably not 20 years old at this point. So, you know, cybersecurity was um, not really a thing, <laughs> or, you know, at that time for me, it really wasn't formally like identified as cybersecurity. But there were some classes that I took in school that really did encourage it. So I don't know if you got, if you all remember the uh, we call them Juarez or Whereas sites. But back in the year 2000, we would be in. I worked for the university, and part of my job was to, as a student, to do the, to image the computers and run the wires to the computers. Okay. And so I also would take those classes. So this was back in you you know the days of Windows NT, like the early Windows Server versions. And so we would sit in class and we would go to the we sites and download exploits and proceed to attack our classmates. There were no rules, right? There was, there's no rules of engagement. There's not all this form of structure. So that was like the fun thing in class is like, I would just literally like attack the other people in my class on the lab network to see if I could like to blue screen their computers. So in a way, maybe, maybe the wrong direction of cybersecurity, but it was, <laughs> but yeah, that was kind of my introduction 
to, I didn't even know what it was then, it was just fun, but it was just my introduction to wow. hacking and cybersecurity back in 2000, just doing that in class. <laughs> so you were a script kitty back in the day, right? But I, I guess, yes, wow, 100%. Right? <laughs> Has that changed? I'm still a script. <laughs> 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 but yes, yes, definitely a script. The error kid. in your ways. <laughs> yes, yes. Hey, there's no shame in being a script kitty. So as long as you know which script to use at which time, right? <laughs> so thinking about the skills that you learned um, in your internship, were there uh -huh. any skills that you were able to take directly into the field uh, or your first role in cybersecurity? Yeah. So so the thing is, you know, my, my internship was in networking department, you know, so... You know, I come out of school from, you know, it's one thing you run, running wires and connecting computers and imaging. So all of a sudden, you know, I walk in and for my internship and, and these guys like these, these hardcore guys, man, they walk over to my desk. They bring me a stack of books and they put them down on my desk, like stack this high. And they say, read this. And they walk away. <laughs> that was my introduction to networking. Wow. And so from that point and I'm like, I don't really read that much, <laughs> but one thing I, I really like always been shocked is like throughout the years, no matter what, like when I was put in situations like that, I somehow managed to get through it. You know, I wasn't an avid reader, but all that material I sat there and I struggled through because I think overall, I, the same thing. I just always had this determination to see. I don't like to fail, you know, yes. and so I did it and I learned it. And so once I kind of got through that material, you know, they threw me in the deep end and all of a sudden I'm an intern and I'm sitting here, I'm monitoring Wait, it was at the time it was about 300 plant locations as an intern and I'm jumping on the phone with the telephone company and screaming at them. So, I mean, when you talk about cybersecurity, you know, network security is huge and it's not a skill set that everybody has. People can learn it academically. But when you get thrown into an environment where you have to learn networking at that hardcore level, that really benefits you. And towards the latter part of my career, it gave me a very unique skill set because mm -hmm. I had this this old school network, you know, network knowledge that a lot of people are never going to get. They're never going to touch like that technology because a lot of technology is gone, you know. <laughs> but when you get plants that are struck by lightning like every two weeks and you're having to replace the equipment every two weeks, work with Telco to get the equipment, you start to see things from the physical layer up, right? Everything you talk about infrastructure security. It's still you start with that cable, the physical layer, you know, data link, all this stuff, part of the OSI or the TCP, you mm -hmm. know, model. And and for me, that was my life. And so understand it on that level and also having to learn like packet transmissions in binary. OK, that was oh, part of zeros it. and ones. Yes. Yes. So understanding like a, a what a, a super frame and jumbo jumbo frame and, and understanding how networking or everything on the Internet really just it's a matter of. Uh, electrical signal or no electrical signal yes. and time, right? This you're measuring a certain time. And if the timing gets off, it breaks. <laughs> if the electrical signals get distorted or they're not powerful enough. So understanding it at that level, man, when I got to cybersecurity, I didn't even realize how good of a feel for me, but everything I've done was a perfect fit or like perfect to prepare me wow. to be in this field. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Just want to remind our audience to please, uh, if you have any questions for Kendrick, please put them in the comment section and we'll be monitoring those. Kendrick, you've given us so far some really good information. Um, exciting to know about a little bit about your background. Now, tell me a little bit about your professional network. Did you have a mentor sure. along the way? If yes. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. All right. No, that, just, you see, I, I feel that, right? You say mentor. Wisdom <laughs> with us. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I've had many, many mentors all the way from college that that did lead to this. Once again, I'm that guy. I was not the ideal student. <laughs> OK, so uh, so coming into the company, a lot of the a lot of the people that were the hardest on me turned out to be some of the most valuable people in life. And so that was, you know, one of the guys that came and dropped those books on my desk. He was a senior engineer. He had already done a whole career in networking, you know. And so bringing that knowledge and then him being in his second career, because his company, his company was either bought out or they something happened to his old company, but they were all came to my company for a second career. You just can't get that out of a book, you know. And so and then there's another guy who's a firefighter. He was very sarcastic. 
And he was a good friend, but he was difficult to work with. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And, and, and that experience, you know, like I knew nothing about Monty Python before this role, but, you know, but after working with him, I knew a lot about it. And all these different cheeky phrases because he was English, you know? Okay. And so that, like, you know, having to, like, understand and like learn to interpret this cheeky, you know, sarcastic, like, type of, of work environment. You know, those different things. So even though I, it's not a traditional sense of a mentor, it was because I learned the soft skills from him, you know, had to adapt. Uh, then my boss in networking, my boss throughout the years, has all he's pulled me aside, sat down, and he told me something that is one of, I, I absolutely believe is, is some of the most valuable advice I've ever been given. Okay, so I'm going to lean in. I want to hear it. Okay. He said, <laughs> always remember there's somebody else that can do your job and can do it better. Mm. Always remember there's somebody else that can do your job and they can do it better. I've lived my entire life from that point forward, never feeling a sense of comfort in any job that I've ever had. I never felt comfortable. So I'm always grinding because I know that that's true. There's always somebody that's more talented. You know, there's always somebody who has better soft skills. They may not even have, they may not have a lot of technical skills, but they may be more, more likable <laughs> and they may be able to accomplish things in different ways. So, you know, that once again, it's, it's an attitude of perseverance yes. that has led me into this field more than anything. And so him being my mentor, that was great. Uh, I, I mean, even back in college, um, there were people, there were times when I was in charge of a very large student organization on campus. And, um, uh, there was a guy who pulled me aside. So it was called the African American Student Organization. And I, I, within two years of college, a sophomore, I was the president of the biggest African American organization on campus. And I proceeded to do a great job, not knowing anything about organizational structure, not doing anything, but everybody liked me. So they made me president. And that turned into like the worst of moments because I got impeached from that position. <laughs> okay. <What happened? laughs> so I got impeached from a student organization. Absolutely. I love sharing these stories of failure because. You have to tell your everybody that I've met that's been really successful has had these type of stories. You fail yes. like over and over again. But there's a guy who came in. He was in charge. His name is Craig Duckworth. And, you know, rest in peace. He came and he was like in charge of the NAACP chapter at Southern Miss. And he brought me in and he literally started teaching me how to be an organizational leader. He, he, you know, and he, I didn't go to the presidency, but he eventually became the treasurer. And so I developed this mentality, like I, he restored me basically mm. as a student Powerful. and taught me leadership. Yes. Once again, cybersecurity and all this stuff, like I'm talking to you now, <laughs> this is a product of many, many years of failures and many people investing in me. And so, but the only thing is after having that really bad debacle as a leader of a of as huge organization, all this visibility, I always felt like I wanted to be an influencer from behind. I never wanted to step out in front. Okay. And so for many, many years of my life, I never really took this, the reins of a or of the president or leadership position because I just didn't feel like I could do it. And I felt like I could just be more become more powerful and influence and, and provide advice and guidance from the shadows. Okay. But that was, of course, untrue, you know, it's human nature to protect yourself. And so uh, if I may jump a little bit into the future, here's the, here's the major transition point. So. So many years after working at Vulcan Materials and in, in the networking department, and I want, and once again, another setback. Um, there are, I definitely want to share this, one of my biggest failures. And uh, because this biggest failure is also one of the reasons why I'm working in cybersecurity. And it's also something that I've talked to other people throughout the years. And they said, oh, yeah, man, I brought down, I brought that entire East Coast of the United States. I've met, because the thing is, when you become the kind of guy, that's or a person. That's my person. I got person. You become the kind of person that's doing something that's really critical. Okay. Just about every day of your job, there's something that you can touch that you can break or impact something. So okay. you you learn to be very very methodical. You learn to seek the guidance and advice for others who are your peers, your coworkers. You know, when you're younger, you want to do things. You want that glory. You know, when you get a little bit older and wiser, you want to make sure that. Things are deliberate and it, there is no complications, no impact, no problems. And as a result of doing a good job, you may get recognition in the future, but you're not so focused on getting that win. 
you know, that, hey, I did it, man, time to take off the shirt, you know, big blue suit up under there or something, you know. And so um, uh, after working in network for several years, my company had a downsizing. A lot of people were let go. But my thing, one of the things I also learned is, is to always be flexible. And like, I'm literally, I hope this helps somebody because I was willing to do whatever was necessary in a job. And so they took me from networking in this prominent networking position. And, hey, I don't have to be a oh, help desk guy to all of a sudden I'm on a help desk. And I was put on a help desk for six years. It was a super humbling experience. Mm-hmm. It was not my favorite time. It was I felt like I'd taken a step backwards in my career. OK, but but I did it. And I grumbled and complained under my voice. At one point, I even sought to uh, to find another career <laughs> at another place because I just didn't feel challenged. What and made so, you stay uh, there? You said six years, six years. I say six years. Yes. Uh, about, about maybe about three or four years in there. I was actually like, I, I decided I was going to, it was, I was ready to take the risk. You know, I'm going to go somewhere. I need to go where I can, I can deal with higher level stuff. You know, I'm tired of dealing with just the users and, and all that. And so I did, I saw it. I had an opportunity to kind of could have gotten a job. It was mine, but I was like so apathetic and just so lackadaisy about it that I didn't give them the stuff they needed on time. And so they, even after the first job came through, they even like put me up for a second opportunity. <laughs> and I, and I think, I think that's the one I capitalized. So for that one, it was like an exchange of server administrator. And so I literally went all in, I built an entire Microsoft exchange environment on my laptop and took it to the interview and showed it to him. Cause you know, I didn't have any, I was a help desk guy. And it's like, okay, if I'm going to be a exchange server administrator, I have no experience. So how do I show that? I took it to him and I showed it and the guy loved it. But his boss was like, we, we're in a situation where we need somebody who's already got experience. You know, they respected what I did, but they needed somebody who was ready to hit the ground running. So I didn't get that. So I'm back on the help desk. And never forget one day my wife came through and hung out with me and she saw me on my help desk. And I was sitting there chatting with her in my cubicle and working tickets. And she was just like, like, oh, my goodness. It's like I didn't understand. You know, she could see it. She was tell I wasn't challenged. You know, I was just kind of there. I wasn't living up to my potential or anything, but it wasn't until I changed my mentality and I said, I'm going to do the best I can at this help desk job. Um, and that was when I got the opportunity to get out. But the reason why I was kind of in the position too, is I became, while on the help desk, I literally started to sell. I was put in manager chain, management training. Yes. And I went to manager training. I became a team lead. I became the, the antivirus administrator. My introduction to security right there for mm-hmm. McAfee. So for like about 6,000 endpoints. And so, and one of the things I took from networking is I knew that McAfee was traditionally known for impacting the network when pushing out updates and that files and stuff like that. And so that was one of the first things I did is I worked with my, my networking department and I was able to take McAfee to and McAfee to the point where it's no longer impacted our network. So I solved a huge problem for the company being in, in, in the antivirus administrator. But there was one day and this came down to a management decision and it was tough. This, this is one I wrestled with for the rest of my life. My biggest, my biggest failure, my biggest public failure. While on the help desk, the accounting servers were uh, being impacted because we actually had a worm that was infecting them. The reason we had a worm infecting them is because the accounting department was, the antivirus was impacting them and it was impeding them doing their jobs. And so our, my, my managers made the decision to turn off McAfee on those servers. And so I did. And as a result, of turning off McAfee on the servers, they actually caught a legitimate worm <laughs> that was spreading throughout this company. And so as that worm was spreading throughout the company, you got the notification, found out it was. And I got on the phone with McAfee and I was working through the issues with McAfee. And, we were, and they wanted me to put in what's called an access protection rule, which is something I never did because it was one of the most dangerous rules you could put in. Okay. And so while on the phone with McAfee, stake number one, I didn't do a change management form. I was in the moment trying to have that big win, wanted to fix it, just like, just complete zeal, you know, a complete zeal, and then just wanted to say, I, I gotta, I can do this, you know, and I was hyper-focused on that, but didn't do change management form, and, and the truth of the matter is, change management forms weren't being done consistently, right, but I learned a lesson that it doesn't matter if it wasn't being done consistently, if it wasn't being enforced, when something major goes wrong, you, the paperwork is going to be, the paperwork trail. It's gonna be yes. your get out of jail, free car, yes, Document, the process. please, people. Document, yes. So I did do it and uh, put the access protection rule in and put 
the wild card in the wrong place in the other code. So instead of blocking the virus, I blocked everything. Okay. And immediately computers start popping up with red X because all of their processes were even blocked. They had like this like dialogue box with a red X and it became known as the red X incident, right? Throughout the company. And so I took it out, took down about one third to two thirds of the company and you couldn't remotely fix it either. So we had technicians all over the United States. And this was my birthday, my birthday weekend in 2012. Technicians all over the company had to run all over to fix over the next three days to get the company back up by Monday. At the, by come Monday morning, all of those technicians were heroes because they did the most amazing thing. They literally went and touched just about all of those computers and were able to put in the code or whatever, register keys or whatever, and unlock those machines and got it. And come Monday morning, we were restored. So everybody in the company became a hero and I became the villain. Okay. Ooh. And and at that at that point, uh, they didn't fire me, but my career was pretty much over. They were going to put me on the help desk and they were going to leave me. Mm-hmm. And so that's why when my wife came through there, I was sitting on a help desk. I was left. I was abandoned. And uh, I was just kind of, I kind of ma- made the decision that I was just going to do the best at it. So, you know, I did my tickets. And this was another thing they wanted us to do tickets for everything on the help desk. The teammates wouldn't do their tickets, a lot of them. And, and when we had the meetings, like they would say, well, you know, I know your ticket count was low. Well, I was so busy, I never got to do it. But my thing is, if you tell me to do a ticket, I'm going to do a ticket. So I did a ticket for everything. And of course, it's like when you got that kind of inconsistency where some mm-hmm. people can do something and then other people do it, then so they started basically, they came with, you know, I got ridiculed for that, for doing a ticket for everything. But that's what they told me to do, <laughs> you know. So I'm, I'm, I try to like really follow the rules, you know. I mean, and so anyway that became a discouraging thing because I was like, why am I doing this extra work to document things when my teammates don't have to do it? Once again, documentation. Didn't know then how this was going to help me, but it did. So a few years later, oh, I'm going to tell you, it's going to, because see now I'm the documentation king. Your boy, (laughs) your boy is ironclad (laughs) at this point (laughs) because because the thing is, I had in order for me to do to document and do tickets, that means I, every task I did, I had to become really efficient, right? Because my teammates weren't always doing tickets. They would just go to the task. So they didn't have the extra overhead. So for every single task I did, I had additional overhead. So I had to learn basically to streamline my process where I could actually input my ticket information as fast as possible so that it doesn't put me behind in being able to serve the customer. So the moment I hit the phone, it's like, you remember like, uh, what is it? Uh, Pursuit of happiness where he would like, uh, he would, and he wouldn't waste time saying goodbye. I think he would just hang up on the customer kind of thing. Well, it was because it was like, he didn't have the time. If they weren't going to buy, you know, you don't waste the time. So anyway, it's the same thing for me. As soon as I picked up the phone, I was already putting that information in. Okay. Like I started immediately. And so I was able to eliminate my overhead. My ticket count was one of the highest. And it was legitimate. It wasn't fudge. It was real. Like, well, if you did the job and you did everything they actually do, that's what my ticket account was. Okay. So anyway, after many years of doing that, six years in, my old boss, who served as a mentor, who was my networking manager, traded another employee back to the help desk with the, with the uh, understanding he would be like a tier three kind of position. He would have perks, you know, to go back. But he literally traded another employee to bring me back in network. It's kind of unheard of. You got a guy who's doing good, but he believed in me so much that he traded employed, brought me back into networking. And when I came back to networking, those same guys that I worked with years ago wouldn't give me any work. So I sat for about two months taking the scrap works that they would give me just into the opportunity. And by the time that I left the networking department in 2018, just about every technician in the company would call me first and work with me. I, I built a rapport. I built for trust. Like they knew I would answer my phone anytime, day or night. And if I missed the call, I was going to call back instantly. And I became one of the most reliable people in that mm-hmm. department. And I didn't have that. And because I've been put on the help desk and humbled, I didn't have that mentality that a lot of tier three uh, technicians and network professionals and security professionals, they have this kind of like elitist attitude. Like I don't want to touch certain things. But me, I lost all that when I was on the help desk again. And so it was one of the best things ever because it allowed me not only to have those help desk skills. So when I'm looking at the security issue, I can look at it from a Windows perspective. I can look at it from a network perspective. I can look at it from a web developer's perspective. Like all these different angles. I've seen everything 
because of this journey that I took. Now, if you had told me back then this is going to end well, and I would be sitting here talking to you on a live stream about my crappy career, <laughs> I never would have believed it. Wow. But that was the journey. And so when I got back in the network, and you better believe I had an appreciation mm. like I'd never had before. You know, so I went back and you think I was hungry before, you know, remember that same mentality. There's always somebody else that can do your job. Yes. Well, if they can do my job, they're going to have to work their butt off. That was my Absolutely. mentality when I came back. And so when I came back to networking, this is where it all started to come together. I joined an organization called InfraGuard. And if you do not know what InfraGuard is, I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D. Say this it one more time my, for our listeners. InfraGuard. So it stands for Infrastructure Guard. It's a partnership between the private sector, which is like companies, you know, regular companies, not, not law enforcement, and the FBI. Partnership between the private sector and the FBI sharing information to protect the United States critical infrastructure from terrorist attacks. I joined the organization. Same thing. I remember I was shell-shocked from college, right? So I joined the organization. And then within like a year, I was vice president of the organization. Okay. And so one of the things I did is when I joined, when I joined, I kind of like I loved what they were doing. I loved the mission. I believed in the mission organization. So I went all in. And then once after being president, I mean vice president for a, a year, I realized that the president was really kind of in a position where he was had a difficult time working with the board. Okay. okay. And so at the end of his uh, his term, the president was like, I'm out, I'm done. And so that was an opportunity for me to step up to the president for the president's position. And in spite of all the, the issues I had and that fear from college, I stepped into the president's position and I proceeded to try to make change. And I was met with the same opposition from the board of directors. And uh, after dealing with all this issue, I, within about a year, I was able to gain the trust, the board of the trust after they threatened to kick me out because I got a little too aggressive. So I had to t tone it down. And this is where soft skills, because remember, as a you're always when it comes to security, you're going to there's a part of you that's going to always be kind of convincing application on the stakeholders, why we need to do this, why we need to make that change and stuff like that. And so in, in that president's position, that board of direction that was very rigid, I had to earn their trust to say, OK, this is what the organization is. This is the change we need to make. And so over a year, I was able to earn and their trust to the point where they were actually willing to roll off the board. I was able to bring an entire new board. And we went from just being a chapter of InfraGuard, which there are like 82,000 members in the United States. Okay. in the United States to become an, a chapter that was like they're using certain things nationally that at, from our chapter as a model for other things in wow. InfraGuard. So our chapter became a very prominent chapter. And so what I did at InfraGuard is when you join InfraGuard, you get information directly from the FBI, Homeland Security, the NSA, and other organizations, right? And so I would take those certain information. I wouldn't take it because I knew if I took too much back to my company, they would become inundated. But I would take the critical things, and this is like when Wanna Cry and all those things hit, but I would read like very important things. And I think I brought the information about Wanna Cry early before this was all over the news, and our company was able to act on it kind of ahead of time and stuff like that. And uh, they valued it. And so then after doing that, I asked for permission as a networking guy to start a security team meeting, which means I would just meet with the stakeholders from you know the application developers, the help desk, it's like all the different critical, like, you know, all the different silos. I asked people from all those people from the, all those areas to come and meet with me just once a month as a security team meeting. I would bring that information I got from the FBI or forever, and we just kind of talk through it and see, you know, what do we need to do? What can we assess? It was just kind of really informal. But I did that for about a year as a security team meeting before, and then this was like 2017, and then right at 2018, the company because uh, I think Tom Fanning was one of our board members. You think he's Alabama Power or a Southern Company guy. He's one of our board members and he was asking about why our company didn't have a security team. And so at that point, from the board down, when you know, when the board's asking, security team coming. And so <laughs> one of my teammates in networking uh, is still one of my favorite people to this day. One of my mentors, technically. Say it again. Tell me why. Why? Because so you remember when I told you I came back to networking, I had opposition from some of my teammates. They made it yeah. difficult. There was one guy who always operated in the basement and he's lived in the basement. He's a great guy, very knowledgeable, you know, and uh, 
And uh, and when I say operating basement, it's just he preferred to be down there where he could actually work. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I don't want to think he's like this recluse or anything because he's one of the most outgoing people, travels all over the world, hiking and stuff like that. But he was always willing to give me information. He didn't feel like he had to guard information or make me work for it or anything like that. He was just always free flowing. It's like because he didn't feel like intimidated. He didn't feel like like his job was ever in jeopardy. So he was like, when I came back into the department, my manager said, if you need to need something, go to him. He'll help you. And he did. And so he helped me to first start, start like working with firewalls and stuff like that. I mean, we worked with Fortigate firewalls. And so he was the perimeter guy for our network, for the network department before we had a security team. And so under him, I learned to work with, you know, Fortigate firewalls, Zscaler and stuff like that. I learned all that from working directly with him. Now, okay. my other, you know, and so as a result of that, when they made a security team, he ended up becoming the manager of the security department. And when he became the manager of the security department, I wanted to go, I wanted to apply, but I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know. I had, I'm not the kind of guy that changed jobs. I've been at 20 something years almost, right? So, same organization. Same job. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's like I wanted to apply for it, but I just didn't feel comfortable like making that shift, you know, or, or even stepping out like, man, like risking like my job to apply for a security guard. What if I got rejected and stuff like that? But after the job had been out there a while, I saw him one day and he say, you know, I got a security position open. Right. <laughs> you know, so he didn't say he do it, but he said it, you know, and, and at that moment, I was like, you're done. Right. OK, Roger that. I'm applying. So I applied for it. Talked to my network manager. He gave me his blessing. Role? I did. I did. And that's that's how I became a member of the security team. But I did it the right way. I sat down. I never forget. Talked to my network manager, who's been a, a friend for many years. We carpooled together and everything. And I never forget. I talked to him about it. He said, you know, he said, gave me his blessing and shook my hand. He said, absolutely. He said, I think you'll do great. And they worked together. He he and uh, my former teammate, who were we were both members of the department, right? Worked to transition me to the department. And when I came into the department, I was all of a sudden working with firewalls full time. I had this responsibility. And I never forget some of the guys who supported us. We had third parties and supporters on the contractor. And I never forget, I got there. And then all of a sudden, there's this feeling of inadequacy again. That, right? you, that you have, that you were feeling. Yes. After all these years, I'm back in, um, I got to the place where I always dreamed of. Like this security position that's kind of always been in the back of my mind from the time of understanding, from the time of seeing hackers and meeting hackers and stuff like that. I'm finally here, and I feel completely inadequate. How do you? And I never, how do you handle that? <sighs> Perseverance, right? You keep hearing that word, right? Yes. So I'm sitting in here, and I never forget. Uh, we had a guy uh, who's former employee went on to be an intern with you know went to other company, and now he was part of the MSSP that that supported us. But he was an intern. So this this kid was amazed. He was went from being an intern to the person who we called in to help us on everything perimeters and network and security wise. And so I never get sitting in those meetings and he's talking about different things in the firewall. And I was like, I, I don't understand any of this, you know. But I would ask questions and I eventually got brave enough to keep asking the dumb questions and over and over and over. And it just took lots of repetition and lots of time playing with it. You know, I was able to get my hands on FortiGate firewalls and I literally ripped out my stuff at home, put in a FortiGate firewall. And thank I me, mean, it's one of the things, it's, just, it's such a blessed opportunity, right? Because FortiGate had this deal where if you signed up for a webinar, they gave you a free firewall. Like, okay. what the freak? How, how lucky am I? And so I literally took all the stuff out of my home, put that FortiGate firewall in, you know, disabled the any any rule and started learning to write firewall rules. Because when you disable the any to any rule that comes by default, nothing works. So you have to write a firewall rule to let every service go through. So I learned, well, what do you need first? Well, you need DNS first. You got to be able to resolve it. So I need to allow DNS. Who am I going to allow DNS out to? What, what public service provider? Stuff like that. So I wrote my DNS. Then you want to allow your web traffic. So I just started from the ground up learning how to make my house work. Mm. And and so and, and that's how I learned. That's one of the things that I really understood over time is that for me, like if I want to learn something, I'm going to do my best to get my hands on it so I can play with it in my free time in a safe environment. And that's the thing, like I, I will say for anybody, you've got to play with this stuff 
in your free time. You're free. You can't have to do. You can't like do nine to five if you're going to be in security of these type of fields. If you want to be a highly technical person, you've got to live this stuff. And so I can assure you <laughs> that every day, the reason I'm even here talking now is because. Outside of my work, you know, I would even like, you know, I used to be a gaming YouTuber and I did pretty good. Got about 13,000 on YouTube and and I was great, happy with that. And uh, but the thing is, after a while, I realized that the whole gaming thing just was not it was not helping me. It was hurting me, you know, In what and way? So I met, because the thing is, I didn't have that time like that time I spent playing video games. You know, if you're if you, those people are making video those video game YouTubers, they're playing a game, then you have to record footage, you have to take the footage, you have to edit the footage up, and then you have to post the footage, and then you have to post it on other social media, promote it, uh, other stuff. That's a lot of ridiculous time. Okay. And so this is where I started making a very important step. And I encourage another thing, like I'm, I'm literally like, I'm telling you everything that is impacting me. I hope it helps anybody that's watching this. Yeah. I realized that I needed to bring my life in alignment. So you know, over here, I'm trying to like succeed on YouTube as a gaming YouTuber, but I'm in a career with cybersecurity and I'm, you know, I'm not really feeling like I'm so comfortable. I kind of have the imposter syndrome here, you know, the whole thing. And I was like, I need to like, I, I got to give this up. You know, this video game thing, like I got an opportunity to grow into security. Where I've wanted to do this all my life. And but I've been growing my YouTube channel for 12 years and I want to see that and I'm attached to it, but I got to let something go. And I've heard lots of people like Will Smith and other great speakers, you know, like, you know, uh, Warren Buffett and all these different people talking. And one of the things that I realized is that and I, I'll quote Will on this. He said that the reason that he realized that when he was uh, doing his thing, that uh, if he was going to be successful, he had to have like a obsession about succeeding at this one particular thing. He didn't have the ability to have his interest spread throughout a whole bunch of things. So, and the reality is most of us, you're trying to do too much. My favorite example is Bob's Chicken and Rib Shack and Shoe Shine and Car Repair and stuff like that. People have all these, these multi-home, multi-purpose businesses. But if you really want to be great at something, you really need to commit because you, we really don't have the time to be great at a million things. You know, you, okay. if you're lucky, you can be great at one thing. <laughs> if you're lucky, some okay. people more, you know, some people can Bo Jackson be great in two sports type of deal. But the rest of us, Probably not. And so I changed my YouTube channel. I went on, I hit all my old gaming videos because I didn't want all the transient chapter from gaming. And I started doing hacking on my YouTube channel. Okay. okay. So that was your that was the path you decided to take. Yes, yes. Okay. So I so I would be on, so I would work all day and then at night I would be on Twitch live streaming and doing hacking on hack the box. Hack the box If you haven't done it, please do it. Try hack me, check it out. Not to mention you need to go through Attack IQ Academy too, because the modern attack the framework, that's been something on my hit list forever to go through your training okay. because it's absolutely well, free. For you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And so the thing is, in doing that, I ran into some real hackers, like the real scary dudes, you know, and scary, they're well, scary people, because this are there's some really cool ladies out there too that have helped me. And so while I'm live streaming, I'm sitting here trying to solve this problem on Hack the Box, they would jump in the stream. And they would uh, help me like they would say, oh, you need this tool. I didn't even know the tool existed. And so what happened by live streaming my journey on hacking and cybersecurity, these people came in and accelerated my growth because they okay. immediately filled in the gap. And all of a sudden I gained knowledge instantly that would have taken me two weeks or never, you know, to find a particular tool. And as a result of that, my growth accelerated. So in my job right there at Vulcan as a blue teamer, all of a sudden, I'm starting to gain these real, like, significant red team skills. And my perspective now as a blue teamer at my job is starting to shift. And I'm starting to feel like it put me in a very interesting space because I started to look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And because my teammates, my teammates were very good and proficient, but they were really focused on doing the job. You know, they weren't, they didn't kind of have this really, like, outlet to interact with all these these crazy talented people who we just don't see on a red daily basis. It sounds like and, it sounds like you had. I'm sorry to know. It sounds like you had like a lot of passion. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Passion. Yes. Yeah. I, I have. So, I have plenty of passion. <laughs> yeah, we're we're almost out of time. Yes. Um, but I want to just say that I want to just mm. just Kendrick. I thank you because during this yes. interview, um, you were comfortable being vulnerable. 
Oh, yes. And sharing not only the highlights, right, but also the failures and how you have learned from them. And so some of the nuggets that that I have kind of taken away is perseverance. It is is humility. It is, you know, yes, you may fall, but you must get up and you must continue. And it is really uh, investing the time to develop yourself. Yes. Oh, yeah. so I thank you. I thank you so very much for sharing your journey. I know that you have a lot more to say. We're going to have to bring you back. Um, <laughs> wonderful, you know, a wonderful time. Um, mm-hmm. Just hearing about, you know, you being totally honest and just thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope it helps y'all. <laughs> it does. It does. Thank you so very much, Kendrick. Okay. okay so uh, as I promised you all, uh, we do have Kareen uh, Ishio. She is our head of global talent acquisition, and she's going to come on and share some resume and networking tips. Kareen, turning it over to you. Hi there. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. And uh, just fresh off of that really inspiring journey and conversation from Kendrick, I, I was left feeling very inspired. Um, And one of the points I would love to uh, focus my talk on today is just the importance of storytelling. Um, One of the really compelling things about listening to Kendrick was just hearing about his journey and the the twists and turns. It really really was a story in every essence of the word. And as a recruiter, uh, one of the things that I see all of the time when I'm interviewing candidates is that um, so often we don't know our own story um, and more often we don't know how to tell our story to another person. And so I feel like Kendrick uh, really did an amazing job of showing us how to tell his story. Um, And he didn't just emphasize the career shifts that he made. He was talking about the human voices in his story. And that includes his networking manager um, and the Monty Python jokes. Um, (laughs) So it's interesting because I think that a lot of us, especially those of us that are really smart and in technical professions, um, we we become really focused on gaining those technical skills and we sometimes uh, lose sight of all of the storytelling and the human aspects of how to, you know, and I'm in the appropriate venue, hack your career. Um, So just a general tip for today, I would say really think about what your story is, because uh, to quote uh, Kendrick, uh, there is always some out there, uh, someone out there that can do your job better than you can. So how do you stand out in that field of insurmountable competition? Um, To me, the answer is to be authentic and to be yourself Um, and try to think about, okay, what is my secret sauce? Is it the perseverance factor? Um, Is it the fact that I have confidence um, in the face of talking to people in the C-suite? Is it my years of help desk experience that are going to equip me to have the best customer service skills ever? Um, So again, I would just say overall storytelling, knowing yourself, knowing what makes you special, and to that end, really focusing on highlighting that and how to tell that story. Thank you so much, Kareen, and thank you, Kendrick. To everyone who is listening today, on behalf of Attack IQ, I just want to wish you all a safe and happy and healthy new year. See you all in 2022. Take care.